Uh, Rachel, you're here. Uh, sorry, Rachel, I had a little impromptu. Um, well, again, I'm sorry to make you late. You can hear me, right? Yeah, I can hear you. I just can't see you. Okay, yeah, you'll be able to see me in just a second, like right now. Okay. Um, but oh. um, I had a little impromptu uh, Lol, Cow, Lol Cow Live uh, interaction that I've been angling for for about uh, three months now. And I told everybody I was going to make it happen, and I did. I'm a man of my word. All right, uh, but that wasn't really what the evening was about. That was just a bonus. Uh, all right, now, a pretty big bonus, I must say. Uh, now... Let me change this here to spotlight because that usually works better for these sorts of things. I used to have a, and I still do have like a special layout for like one side and the other, and I, I can still set all that up, but um, I just haven't, um, I've been lazy about doing it for a minute, if I'm being honest. Um, but so that's why we do it like this uh, recently on our, on our blood sports. Um, but let me, and again, um, that would definitely be something you would not have wanted on the Crucible channel probably. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know what? I had a great time. Rachel, again, Rachel Wilson, welcome back to the show. It's been quite a while. Yeah, it's been a long time. It's good to be back. It's good to be back. It's good to have you back. Stardust, has it been so long for you? How you hey, doing? how's it going? Pretty good. Thanks pretty for good. having me back. Pretty good. Oh. I, you know, actually, I ain't gonna lie. People said I was sweating yesterday. I actually did work up a little bit of a sweat today because I was going, I was going pretty hard. Uh, on that last little appearance, you you ladies maybe can go back and watch it later. I'm sure I'm sure we'll get around. Uh, but anyway, tonight we're here to debate feminism. I feel like I'm back in my Gamergate days. And again, I'm the neutral moderator. Of course, I think everybody knows probably my thoughts. But I'm the neutral moderator, and I'll play devil's advocate. Mostly, I'm going to stay out of it because you you both have been involved with uh, blood sports here on this show, and you know that mostly I kind of just let you guys handle the conversation every mm -hmm. once in a while i'll step in uh if needed or if i think i have a pertinent question or or there's a super chat or or something relevant but i like the participants to drive the conversation uh and not the moderator because i'm here talking you know eight hours a day some days uh and i think people want to hear the participants and not me so that's why i do it that way um I, do i have a coin let me see if i can find a fucking peso around here then they were talking about me living in mexico like that was a bad thing man mexico's awesome i hate to tell you guys how can i not find one fucking peso that's fucking crazy <laughs> i had like a thousand pesos like, i'm not even kidding just Pesos Have everywhere. you learned all the currency yet, or you yeah. did it like? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, Actually, I follow the currency markets pretty closely now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you want to know cool. the truth, uh, but uh, I don't see a peso. So if one of you guys want to pick, who wants to go first, or I can just pick just at random. Um, it, it, I'm fine either way. Um, okay, you know what? How about this? I think this makes more sense. Rachel, make the case against feminism. Okay. Well, gee whiz, I haven't thought about this very much, but I'll, I'll give it a try. <laughs> uh, yeah, so feminism is a silly little experiment that I think will be uh, looked back upon in the future as a bizarre blip in history that we tried um, out of, you know, hubris and ignorance and that it failed and, and not before causing catastrophic amounts of damage, of course. So, um, the, I think what kind of prompted this was when Stardust was here last time with Andrew debating the Hunter Avalone situation mm -hmm. with the shooting and all that. And um, she kind of, she got a little bit heated about the idea that like the woman can't be the one to like jump in and save the day, right? Uh, no, not really. We're, oh, sorry. I, I don't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there was something there with like between you and Beckett and you were like, uh, I don't want to be rescued, and if you try to rescue me, I'm gonna like dump you or something like that. And I was no. <laughs> if I can explain it, I, maybe I can explain it a little bit better. But um, yeah. but essentially, I got irritated because um, uh, basically it was like okay. Um, for me, I was just like yeah. Um, if you're gonna go out, I'm gonna go out too, and you know, otherwise we would both stay in. But um, if you're going out, I would go out, and um, it's not like you can stop me. And the thing that irritated me, it's not that he wanted to protect me. That's totally fine. What irritated me was um, was him being like, well, yes, I can. And it might be true that he can. It certainly is true that he can. I just don't, I just didn't like that statement, right? Um, because our relationships never work that way. You know, it's never been, um, it's never 
work that way in particular. Did I fly off the handle? Obviously, yeah, but part of it was like I was being a little bit theatric. I was trying to make people laugh. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that just kind of prompted for me, like, let's have this debate again about the nature of things because, um, you know, Andrew's kind of famous for making this argument. I always make this argument as well that, you know, when we're talking about egalitarianism and saying mm -hmm. it's like a, an illusionary pipe dream is we're just giving a description of what's real, um, you know, in the world around us. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that women have rights, uh, they have it at the behest of men who are willing to enforce those rights for them. There's a, a viral clip we just most of us probably all saw. If you guys saw this female judge who uh, there was like a hearing for this violent felon who wanted to be paroled and the judge said, no, I'm not gonna parole you. And the guy went nuts and jumped over the thing and like started attacking the judge. Well, Screwed men had to rush in and pull wrong. this violent felon off over. of the female Ralph judge. So Rachel people Wilson often will say, bottle. Oh, but women can have power. Women have power now. It's not just the men. Look at the female judges. Look at the female senators. Look mm -hmm. at the female cops. And it's like, yeah, but whenever it comes down to it, it's always going to have to be men who are going to enforce whatever pow power, illusion of power these women have. So the judge can make a ruling, but who's going to be the one to drag the violent felon off to jail? It's not going to be a bunch of women, you know? So my thing is just to say that um, trying to force egalitarianism on people, not only does it have a ton of horrible effects on society, which we can get into if you guys want, but it's just kind of a pipe dream. You just have the illusion of having rights because there are men who, for whatever reason, are willing to enforce it. And I think we're heading toward a point where most men are starting to struggle to find reasons to enforce women's rights at all anymore because not only are men getting the short end of the stick but so are women and children and society at large so hmm. that's kind of what kind of where i wanted to go with it okay um so i so i'll do my opening um uh everybody here knows me but just in case hi i'm stardust um uh so um i mean i i, I i'm here to kind of explain what feminism is about what it's not about um, and uh, kind of like try to understand um, where Rachel gets her ideas from. Um, my goal isn't to make anybody in the audience a feminist. Um, my main goal is to kind of show that there, to me, I think that there is some hypocrisy in Rachel's beliefs. And I do think the way that she comes to her conclusions um, demonstrates kind of just a lack of intelligence. Um, so feminism is the belief. I Sorry. Uh, <laughs> feminism is the belief that ensuring women's freedom and equality of opportunity in all spheres of life is a crucial priority. Again, that's equality of opportunity and, and freedom, right? Um, and that can be in a wide variety of ways, right? It can be social, political, economic, or personal in nature. Um, beyond that, feminism is super diverse in thought. So we're known for infighting. Um, uh, you know, we often choose different things to focus on. Some women will focus on, you know, reproductive stuff, others on education, others on rights in other countries. Um, and the conclusions we draw from feminism also can be very different depending on who you talk to. Um, uh, for example, you know, feminists all the time will argue about pornography, sex work, um, transgender issues, quota systems, and more, right? These are things that we just do not agree on. Um, and and, uh, and um, you know, it, again, it, just very diverse in thought. The main uh, thing that is essential to feminism is the belief in ensuring women's freedom and equality of opportunity. Um, we're not a monolith. Um, so uh, from, I did a lot of research for this. Um, Rachel um, has written and spoken about feminism as if it's like a religious cult, essentially. With the amount of infighting and diversity of thought, I find it hard to see why she thinks it's a cult. Um, she believes that feminism and Satanism are inextricably linked, um, that people like Susan B. Anthony um, could be Satanists. Um, she thinks the first wave of feminists were made up of occultists, mystics, communists, and socialists funded by wealthy industrialists. I'm not sure what wealthy industrialist means. Um, I'm assuming the Jews. Um, weird that the wealthy industrialists would fund people that go against their interests, right? Um, uh, so that's like one thing I have a problem with. Rachel believes that feminism rewrote history, that women have been less oppressed than we think. Um, 
How does she explain historians with no feminist ties confirm that women historically have been oppressed or that today around the globe, women are still uh, oppressed? For one example, you know, women in India, when they're on their periods in some places in India, they go stay in a hut for all those days that they're on their period. Um, uh, also, she believes that women should never work outside the home. Um, or at least very rarely do so. Um, uh, never mind that women have worked outside the home all throughout history. Um, in fact, it's only a minority of people who are ever able to stay at home and be stay at home wives. Um, in fact, I would say, I would go so far as to say it's the wealthy elites who historically ended up having stay at home wives. Um, and they ended up hiring female workers actually to help their stay at home wives. So even in the most traditional societies, women still did work outside the home. They were just segregated from men. Um, she also believes that feminism, feminism's goal is to destroy the family and discourage motherhood. Um, I just find that ridiculous because feminism has historically helped families. Um, uh, if you want to name a movement that uh, has advocated against child labor in favor of family and medical leave, in favor of maternal mortality reduction, and in favor of security for stay-at-home moms, that's feminism. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that's basically all I have to say about this. So thanks. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to try to, you hit on a lot of points there. So I'm going to try to be somewhat brief and not write a whole book about each one of them. Um, the you first wouldn't one is do that, that right old book about feminism. <laughs> I, I already sure. did. And there's I know. two more, there's two What's more the coming book, out by the way, year. plug the book. Yeah, sure. It's called occult feminism, the secret history of women's liberation. Um, I'm, I would love for Stardust to, I would happily send you a copy if you want to go through my source material, if you want to read it, if you want to like come up with a rebuttal or something, I'd be happy to hear it. I've actually been contacted by several academics who've read it and checked the source material and who have actually expanded on it. I just presented my first academic paper at a theological seminary conference, and that paper was also published in an academic journal. So there's definitely plenty of academics who do think there's some meat and some, you know, veracity to what I'm saying. Um, but let's start with the whole feminism is about freedom and equality of opportunity. First of all, um, if, when you say freedom, it's like freedom to do what, right? Freedom to do what? This is the big question. It turns out after over 100 years of feminism, it's mainly the freedom to, you know, do sexually deviant behavior. It's mainly the freedom to break up your family. Uh, it's mainly the freedom to uh, leverage the state against men in what I would say is a very unfair way. Um, and I don't think it's ever been about equality of opportunity at all. Of course, they'll say that. They say these things. All the all the revolutionary leftist social movements tell you that they're just doing this because they really love you and care about you and they want you to have a good quality of life and they want to end suffering. It's all baloney. I mean, there are there some who believe that? Sure. But the people who are behind these movements, it's not about that. And Stardust made the statement that, um, you know, she doesn't understand where I get this idea that the feminists wanted to destroy the family. Well, I'll tell you where I get the idea. I get it from feminist writers themselves. Um, the reason that the history has been rewritten is because when the Rockefellers and the Ford Foundation started women's studies departments in the 70s, they gate kept the history and rewrote it. And they will tell you this themselves. If you look up a woman, um, who created standpoint theory, Sandra Harding is her name. Give her a little Google, read about her. Um, she says that we have to rewrite the history from the standpoint of the oppressed woman because these evil white men are going to tell you that there's such a thing as an objective historical timeline of events. Well, she doesn't believe that that's true. She thinks that what you have to do is find the most intersectionally oppressed person who from her eyes would be maybe like an indigenous um, LGBT woman of color uh, who's disabled or something, right? And she would say that that person has the most levels of oppression through which to view the history. Therefore, they're going to have the most accurate take on how the history happened. And this became the dominant narrative of women's studies departments in the 70s because um, Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller found Sandra Harding at his experimental university and promoted her and funded her and pushed her through all of the Ivy League schools. So that's how that happened. Um, but furthermore, beyond that, um, as far as oppression, if, if you want to argue about women's oppression, I'm kind of known for posting things to Twitter, to my Instagram, um, like old suffragette pamphlets, old um, pieces of propaganda from anti-suffragists as well as suffragists showing that women 
uh, did not want suffrage. Women didn't want feminism. It was deeply unpopular. Only about 4% of women historically even wanted to have the vote. And this is because they said, we actually have a lot of privileges and protections that we gained under male suffrage that we will lose if you make us politically equal with men. We will become just another voting block. We'll become just another lobbying arm. We won't have a moral high ground from which to you know, uh, protect the interests of families and children. And that's exactly what happened. Um, as far as women working outside the home, it's true that some women did work outside the home. And I'm not against women ever working outside the home. People are very bad at hearing what I actually say. They only hear what they think I mean, right? So if you're a young unmarried woman and you wanna have a job for a while, I think that's perfectly fine. It's historically been perfectly fine. My grandma who's 97 worked at a grocery store from the time she was about 16 until she got married when she was 19. No problem with that. Once her kids grew up and moved out, she got a little part-time hostessing job at a restaurant to work with her friends, get out of the house, have some fun. No problem with that at all either. And women certainly prior to the industrial revolution worked they just tended to work on the family homestead. Um, they might, you know, if you were an unmarried woman, you might be like a school, a school teacher. You might run an orphanage, something like that. So yes, women worked, but women did not work outside the home in mass until the 1970s. If you look at the uh, statistics on this, prior to 1965, the number of uh, married mothers who worked outside the home was like five percent. By the time you get to 1980, that jumps to almost half of married women with school-age children at home entering the workforce. Now, you almost doubled the workforce in about a decade, which had a major effect on men's wages, stagnated them, and made it to where we no longer have a family wage, we have an individual wage, which made it extremely hard for families that do want you know, a, a single income and mom to be at home to do that. And this pushed even more mothers into the workforce. So now we're kind of stuck in a vicious cycle where even the moms who don't want to be in the workforce kind of have to if they want a decent standard of living. So it's more complicated than reading the feminist propaganda of our day, which just tells you that women were chained to a stove and oppressed. You could beat them and grape them. Uh, they couldn't read. They couldn't write. All that stuff is nonsense. And I take several chapters in my book to prove that. That I know that's not a claim you can just make, right? So. I'll just kind of start with that. Okay, um, so to start off, um, if feminism is freedom, it's freedom to engage in sexually deviant behavior and stuff like that, um, freedom to engage in harmful behavior. Um, again, I would point to the, I, to the fact that, again, feminism is not a monolith. Not every feminist agrees with engaging in sexually deviant behavior. There's a huge group of feminists who don't agree with sex work, me being one of them. Um, uh, you know, there, it, it's, um, uh, I don't think it's uh, really accurate to um, to just uh, characterize all of feminism being about freedom to engage in sexually deviant behavior. It is specifically about like equality of opportunity for women and um, and this giving women the same types of liberties um, that men would have. Right. So can, um, can you give me an example, like a specific a couple of examples of what things you think women weren't free to do before that they are now and why that's good? So, I mean, obviously we're going to disagree on this, right? But like, obviously voting was one of them, um, uh, working outside the home, you know, I mean, working was always, again, something that women did, but, um, women often, uh, um, advocated or feminists specifically advocated for, um, more equality of opportunity in workplaces, um, less like hiring discrimination right now. Um, you know, some discrimination is okay. Right. Um, if somebody is able to like lift heavy things. Right. Um, uh, and also, okay, um, let's, let's just start with the voting thing. Are you aware of the fact that also wait, one at a time, hold on, wait, wait, one at a time. Let's start us finish our point there and then I'll let you get in. Sorry. I have to be my mod self here. Go ahead. Finish your point. Start us no and then I'll let you get in. Yeah. I mean, um, Unless yeah, you forgot I, I, it, and then don't worry about it. Yeah, I forgot, I forgot it. Yeah, but um, but if we if you're gonna bring the point that like most feminists or most women, not feminists, most women didn't support the right to vote, um, that's fine. Most people did not support Martin Luther King, um, uh, when he was around, right? Um, and and you know, doing some quick reading, it seemed like Christian women didn't want the vote at first, um, but then helped push the amendment. Um, so. So it, it doesn't seem like it was, you know, it, it, initially, yeah, maybe women didn't want the right to vote. Maybe they didn't think they needed it, but seems that, you know, a lot of them adopted and changed that belief. So, 
Well, I, what I would say to that is most men could not vote until right before all women could vote. So mm -hmm. both in the UK and in the United States, there were large sections of the male population who also couldn't vote until right before women could. So, mm -hmm. but it's never presented that way. It's always presented as though the, all the men had all the power through all of history until 1920. And it's just far I wouldn't agree with that. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't agree um, with that. But I think every I, instance you can point to of women being oppressed, I could point to instances of men being further oppressed. For example, for only 40% of men historically have ever been able to reproduce, whereas 80% of women historically have been able to wait, reproduce. Wait, 4% of women men, it. really? Is that true? 40%, I think. 40. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say. Okay, 40. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't okay, know that. Twice, each of us has twice as that many female ancestors as male <laughs> ancestors, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just saying it's, it's a huge genetic advantage that shows you that women had one of the greatest powers there is, which is the power of mate selection. Um, and now what we've done with the sexual revolution is make that even worse. So now we don't even have a birth rate that's above replacement because when it's left to women, when women can just go, you know what, I think I'm happy with my little apartment and my cat and my Netflix and my DoorDash. So I'm just going to ride the cock carousel until I hit the wall, at which point I'll try to get Chad to marry me, but Chad doesn't want me because I've hit the wall. So I'm just going to be single for the rest of my life and it's fine. So now we're at a point where within the next few years, half of of all women of childbearing age are never going to have a baby. This has never happened before in the history of the human race, and it could be catastrophic. It might be a species ending event. And so far, the women I've asked about this tell me, hey, if the species has to end for women to be happy, then that's just how it's got to be. But one more thing that I forgot to address was this wealthy industrialist thing, because uh, Stardust insinuated that I'm talking about Jewish power. It's actually not the case. I know there's going to be some people in the audience who aren't going to like to hear this, but the people who funded feminism were the Rockefellers, the Ford Foundation, the Carnegies, and a few of those. When I say golden age industrialists, those guys are, are white Protestants. Okay. okay. So yeah, I hate they, to disappoint people because everybody thinks I'm going to get to that. Now on the Marxist side, there were more of those, but even there, it wasn't uh, completely a Jewish power play. It's more of something that some of them jumped on the bandwagon later, but it was really like Anglo elite wealthy industrialists mm -hmm. who funded this because they wanted women working in factories at a low wage. They wanted um, the kids to be raised in, you know, mandatory public schools so that they could indoctrinate them with uh, kind of a, a technocratic uh, industrialist view of the world that was going to make them into good little worker bees. This is something that they write about as well. If you go to the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Foundation archives, they brag about this as though it's a wonderful thing they did for everyone. Okay, so if it was wealthy elites, regardless of like whether they're Jewish or not, um, mm -hmm. it, that were funding this, why would they fund a movement that it, 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 in all likelihood would make them less likely to be those wealthy elites, right? Oh, it um, didn't. It didn't. Take a look at how things are right now. So they passed all this at the same time. It was the same little group of guys who went to the Jekyll Island Club and created the uh, Federal Reserve Banking System, mm -hmm. the Federal Reserve Act, and they also created the Income Tax Act. So they got the Federal Reserve Bank set up, they passed an income tax, and then they uh, passed women's suffrage. They were the ones who funded this and got all the senators and congressmen talked into it because, like I said, it gives them this huge pool of cheap labor. It gives them a ton of votes from people who are very easy to sway because women are the, the reason you see political ads talking about how, you know, Republicans want to kill the old people and the babies and the Democrats are going to save everybody with welfare. It's because you can, uh, tug at the emotional heartstrings mm. of women who are designed to be mothers and want to like, they tend to be more socialist because their innate sensibility say everyone should be fed, everyone should be safe, everything should be clean. And they then pervert those instincts for their own gain. So now what do we have? Now we have no longer really this like Republican, um, you know, representative republic. We have a universal suffrage democracy, which is basically just a front for a shadow oligarchy. You have major international corporations that run fucking everything. Okay. So yes, it was I a great plan questions. and it worked exactly how they wanted. Okay, so sure. if it was Protestants, it was wealthy Protestants funding this, um, why were they funding Satanists and Marxists? Um, uh, secondly, um, uh, again, wealthy industrialists funding Marxists and communists, that doesn't seem to serve them whatsoever. Um, uh, especially if these this block of uh, women who are voting are voting to um, for more like socialist type 
policies, right? That doesn't make mm -hmm. any sense to me. Well, I'll explain it, especially since you said that you think I think these things. And also Marxist my... corporations makes no sense either. That's like a juxtaposition. Yes, it yes, it does. And I'll explain it. Okay. So this here I will come in with my lack of intelligence and explain all of this for you so you can understand mm -hmm. it. Uh, these people did not have any care whether you ended up with a capitalist or a communist society. There's something called the Hegelian dialectic, which means you create a problem, you present a solution, and then you are in control of what the solution is, right? Uh, problem reaction solution is the like most common way to explain this. And one proof we have of this is that the same wealthy billionaires on Wall Street who funded the feminist movement are the same ones who actually funded the Bolshevik revolution and supported them when they took over Russia. They did. These wealthy industrialists who you would think are capitalists funded Marxism mm -hmm. and Bolshevism and communism because they said, and again, you can go to their own writings. You go to the Rockefellers um, authorized biography. You can go to, um, there's several books that have been written on this, several professors who've written on this. They funded both sides, just like they did in the Napoleonic Wars. These people funded both sides of the Napoleonic War so that they'd have stake in both sides so that no matter who wins, they come out on top and they decide what happens after. This is the same thing. They funded communism in the East, they funded capitalism in the West, and they pushed feminism in two different ways on mm -hmm. both different societies so that they could you can engineer a collapse this way and have what we have now. What we have now is Google runs everything. Elon Musk runs everything. Um, these big industrialist internationalists who are not, they may have started capitalists in a way, they're not. It's its all about creating like this global economy and this global hegemony where they have total control of everything. And that's exactly what they've gotten. I, I mean, you can just look at the results of it to see that what I'm saying is true. So we, you know, um, okay. does that make any sense? Um, so you, you've said a lot. So I guess let's start with um, wealthy financiers funding the Bolshevik re revolution. Um, I have heard this theory before, um, uh, but I guess I would I would want to ask you, what type of financiers are these? Like uh, you said, they work on Wall Street. Um, uh, do they work in banks like um, I, I guess I would ask my question about that. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So if you need to, if you need to conduct a revolution, if you need to have a war campaign, you got to have a war chest. You have to have money. You have to get funding mm -hmm. from somewhere. Um, and so Lenin and Trotsky both were funded by wealthy uh, Wall Street hedge funds. Um, Dr. Richard Spence talks about this and I'm, I'm having like a, just a brain fart to remember the other professor's name who's written an entire book about this. Um, and I can look it up, but yeah, they, if you, that's something that's well known <laughs> that all the Marxists in the East who came to power were funded by wealthy Wall Street millionaires and billionaires through their banking systems, through their hedge, hedge funds, you need funding, mm -hmm. right? They, they didn't just, the Bolsheviks didn't just come out of nowhere because they felt, this is a, a, a common thread in history. You don't just feel oppressed, rise up, and then, you know, get rid of the czar and then it's happily ever after. That's not how things work. That's a completely naive view of history. There's always powerful people behind the scenes. Funding. Do you know the names of, of like the people who were funding or like the specific like hedge funds or stuff like that? Yeah, hold on one sec. Let me check my, check my thing here. Okay, Professor Anthony Sutton, his book, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution details all the uh, specific banks, the specific okay, but do people. you have, uh, do you yourself know the specific people and specific hedge funds? No, because it's not as, it wasn't like one specific person. It was a handful of right. people. But do you, it, do you know it at was, least a few names or anything yes, like that? Yes, the Rockefellers. So you'll find the Rockefeller Foundation behind most of this stuff. They were at the time the wealthiest people in the world and they were the engineers of the progressive era. Now, I would love to sit here and continue teaching a history lesson, but number one, that's going to get everyone really bored. And number two, I would like an argument from you. When you told me that um, feminism wanted to give women freedom of equality they didn't have before and you said um, equal opportunity, opportunity in the workplace and you said uh voting so we already established that you know this country was not founded as a universal suffrage democracy it was supposed to be a limited uh mm -hmm. representative republic okay so 
black people didn't always have the right to vote. A lot of men who weren't landowners didn't always have the right. There were plenty of people who were oppressed, I guess you could say. Women were not special in this regard, so that's one thing. And also, um, but I hate to interrupt, two, but Jacob Schiff is one of the people who funded the Re Russian yes. Revolution. But anyway, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, go the ahead. Schiff family. I know that's Schiff a little bit of an interruption on one side, but but anyway, but but go ahead. Sorry, I just I interviewed Ron Unge recently, so, so I do. Oh, yeah, know. yeah. So I do happen yep. to know that. But anyway, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I didn't mean yeah, to cut I was you just, off. I, didn't mean to I was just saying, um, so yeah, women can vote, I guess, but they didn't vote for a long time. They didn't even start to become a major voting bloc until the eighties. Again, mm -hmm. once you, pu once you push them all into the workforce and they're all paying taxes, then suddenly they want to vote. Right. Um, and now they actually outvote men. Now they're actually a bigger voting bloc than men because there's actually more women in the workforce than men. Yet men mm -hmm. still have all the most dirty and dangerous jobs that run all the infrastructure and create this world that allows women to do what we're doing right now, right? You and I can sit with our cute stuff in the background and we put on our makeup and we show up on Ralph's stream and we argue about feminism. We couldn't do any of that if men didn't build the infrastructure, the internet, the, who put the satellites up there that we have this internet, not women. Who built your computer? Who do you call? Do you, think that, do you think that women would be men. accepted? Do you think women would be accepted in media at all if it were not like feminists pushing for women to be more widely accepted? In media, you mean like mainstream media or just you and I talking media, on a live media, stream? In general, you and I talking, right? This would like if without feminism, this would probably not be approved of. Well, I don't know that you know you think that because you've been told that by feminist propagandists but how was it that in the 1700s mary wollstonecraft is parading around europe um having threesomes screwing around with some of the prominent intellectuals of her day who are funding her trips all over the world to give little mm -hmm. speeches and write little pamphlets nobody put her in jail nobody told her she couldn't do that she she didn't even really get any societal well she financier too huh What's that? She had a she had a wealthy financier as well. Yeah, there's always. That? A, what's that? Who was that? Who was financing her? Well, you'd have to look in my book because I have but a you list. You should know it, right? You should know no, at least because a couple of names, right? It's, a, it's several different people who owned prominent newspapers, mm -hmm. and they were pushing revolution in the French Revolution and in America. To name at least like well, one, Thomas right? Paine. Thomas Paine is one. Okay. Um, I would have to just look because yeah, this, I don't have all of this at the top of my, I'm usually pretty good with the facts, but do you okay. have an argument or are you just going well, okay. to so me about Sutton, my knowledge you brought, on feminism? Up, you brought up Sutton, right? And yep. if you, if you talk to historians, it seems like Sutton is not, um, is not very um, valuable as a source when it comes to the, the Bolsheviks, right? The Bolshevik revolution. Um, uh, so that is, um, one thing I would say about like, you know, financiers um, in America funding the Bolshevik revolution. Um, uh, secondly, um, it seems that, OK, feminism, uh, first wave feminism was financed by um, people who didn't have the working class interests in uh, in mind. Yet feminism has been pretty focused on working class women um, uh, and, and their ability to succeed within society. Right. Um, yeah, Sutton seems to be like widely discredited. Um, so no, uh, he's not, he was a, he was a, he's passed on now, but he was a very well-known and respected Ivy league professor. There's always people who have different, you know, takes on history and things like that. But as I said, who's in charge of the narrative of feminist history now it's women's studies departments do you think anybody does do you think anybody says to themselves i'm going to become a professor of women's studies because i'm not completely already indoctrinated with feminism of course not the only people who go into this field are people who think these feminists were like epic heroes i know because when i do my research and i listen to lectures from any of these women all they do is just gush and oh my god she was just so amazing and she told the patriarchy screw you i'm gonna do what i want and i'm gonna have free love and screw all my boyfriends out of wedlock they so the people who study the feminist history and gatekeep it and by gatekeeping i mean they physically have a lot of the records in their you know libraries that you have to ask permission to go get get the records and things like that so they can create the narrative and are many people going to want to go against the mainstream narrative and be under the kind of scrutiny that i've been under or that sutton's been under not really Do but initial not feminists would want to go against the mainstream narrative either what's that do you think mainstream feminists would want to go against the traditional narrative either they especially when you're bringing up 
but you're bringing up that most people didn't narrative. want women to have voting rights. Most women didn't want women to have voting rights. How much right. of that was because they didn't want to go against the main narrative? It wasn't because of that at all. Because how do you know that? I can tell you how I know that because I've read their writings. There was larger, there was larger uh, membership in anti-suffrage groups than there was pro-suffrage groups. Right? And these women, these women had, these women had public debates. They wrote mm -hmm. their own tracks. They wrote their own pamphlets. They had their own posters. They had their own organizations that had mission statements. And if you go back and read them, they made excellent arguments. They said, look, this is going to destroy the nuclear family. This is going to increase divorce. This is going to ruin the, the moral fabric of society because you're going to have a bunch of, you know, kids being born to Lord knows who. And if you go back and read the writings of feminists like Alexandra Kolontai, who was the premier Bolshevik feminist, she was the commissar for social welfare, one of Lenin's most powerful broads, uh, right? And also a spy. She mm -hmm. said, she said specifically, and this is, you made this claim that, oh, why would they want to destroy the family? Well, I'll tell you why. She said, look, if you want to get rid of private property and you want to get rid of, you know, capitalism, you want to give everything to the state, then what you have to do is destroy the family. People can't know what their, what their paternity is. People shouldn't know who their dad is because that's how private property and private wealth is passed down is through the father. If you neuter men, if you remove all motivation for them to build a legacy, to own a business, to buy land because they don't even know who their kids are or they can't have custody of their children, they won't do that. And so she formed creches, which were these daycares and pushed all the women into factory work and told them all, you need to stop seeing yourselves as mothers and you need to start seeing yourselves as labor units. You are a labor unit and your, your child doesn't have a daddy. Lenin is their daddy. You should see Lenin as your husband and as your children's father and that there shouldn't be private property. And she even advocated, she was the one who got marriage removed as a sacrament of the church, made it a flimsy legal agreement Russia was one of the first places to have no-fault divorce, and they were the first country in the world to legalize abortion, and it was all because of her. And she said the reason for this is to make sure that nobody can pass down private property or wealth generation to generation through the father. And she encouraged people to do communal living and communal raising of children. She wrote several, like, puff pieces of like, uh, you know, women's romantic fiction about women who had polyamorous relationships, didn't know who their baby daddy was and how this is actually really a great thing. And it's a good thing because then we don't own each other. We all work for the state, comrade. We all work for Lenin, right? So it was intentional. And I know I'm one of the only people that goes back and reads all their boring writing, but they tell you exactly what they believe. Sure. Read her autobiography of an emancipated communist woman and tell me. If I'm wrong. Marxist feminism, Marxist feminism is, is not even mainstream today, right? Oh, it is. No, it's, it's absolutely it's mainstream. Liberal yes, feminism one at a time, in the academic one at a time, institutions, one at it time, is. Liberal time, feminism is, is the prevailing, uh, you know, most popular form of feminism. Not and in the academic then, institutions. Well, even then, one at a time. Even then, even one then time, right? Like I said earlier, feminists are not a monolith. We all argue with each other constantly. We do not agree on anything. And when it comes to um, uh, this person making an argument, uh, what's her name? Um, Colin, 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 Ty. Yeah, Colin Ty. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, the idea of the nuclear family, the nuclear family is also something that's relatively recent. We had intergenerational families before. And um, and with the advent of the nuclear family, you had people being more isolated from their from their um, in-laws, from, you know, from their grandfathers, grandmothers. And in the past, you did have more of a community raising children. You had the extended family. You had um, grand grandmothers and grandfathers who were also contributing to raising these children. So. Yes, um, you, like you can um, claim that Colin Ty, um, uh, you know, was putting all these ideas out there, but how mainstream were those ideas really? In reality, when it comes to women working, um, uh, you know, a lot of the reason why women push uh, other, you know, younger girls to learn um, skills and learn how to work is that you never know what's going to happen to a partner. You don't know if they're going to die. You don't know if they're going to become disabled. You don't know if they're going to run away. Right. So you do need to have the ability to go out and work um, if your family needs it, if your children need it. Right. OK, 
Well, the first silly thing you said there is th that we somehow there's this false dialectic between you either have a nuclear family or you have an intergenerational family. It's not an either or, it's a both and. So you've got your mom and dad and your kids who live in a home, but they would traditionally have moms, dads, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents all living relatively nearby. You know and the definition of nuclear family? Yeah. The, when you say the nuclear family, you're talking about the mom and the dad and the kids, right? But it's not a choice between the two. You people do this all the time on the left. You act like we have to choose either the nuclear family or intergenerational families. Now, we don't all have to live like uh, people who have seven generations in one house. We can have mom and dad and the kids in a house and then have grandma and grandpa live down the street. Our cousins are next door. My sister and brother live across town, right? That's what America was. That's what most of the West was for the last several centuries. That's fine. But feminism destroyed both of those things. It, it wasn't. And when, you, when you say how mainstream was it, again, Alexandra Kolontai was the commissar for social welfare in Russia. She was the number three most powerful in politician in Russia. In Russia. And, this, and listen to me, this spread. She was the first to create these systems of daycares, of making abortion not only legal, but also paid for in state hospitals. And mm -hmm. it got so bad in 20 years that Stalin had to outlaw abortion again because they had three abortions for every one live birth in Russia. It was collapsing their population. It was catastrophically bad. So she okay. was extremely influential. One and it affected academic all, in Russia all of the USSR, all, all of the feminism. satellite. What's that? One, no, one you, this idea that oh, we're, not there's so much diversity. There's so much diversity really in feminist thought. really is. What, what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the, the effects are the same. So you all want to smash the patriarchy. You all want women in the workforce, including mothers. Now, as I said, I don't care if some women Not want to true. work, but pushing mothers into the workforce in mass, you just said, you just said, oh, well, you have to be able to work and make money because you don't know what will happen to your husband. To. You have to be able to. That doesn't mean or, you have to go out there and work compulsory. Well, Stardust, you'll find plenty you... of feminists who are totally fine with stay-at-home moms, totally fine with... Um, no, they're not. Uh, yes, they are. I'm they a stay-at-home mom and they're relentlessly attacking me. They're trying to prove that I that I worked at some point in time, therefore I'm a hypocrite. Or, I, well, that's a nice privilege for you, but not all of us are that lucky. And Most... then I say, wait a minute, you just told me you're fighting for the right to work. But then you say, I'm privileged because I don't work. It can't be both. You have to pick one. It can't be both of those things at the same time. It's um, bullshit. Okay. So this nonsense idea that, oh, there's so much diversity of thought. No, no, no. We see the effects. We know what the effects are. The effects are men are getting screwed in family court, right? They're Children really are being not, raised but... in broken homes and out of wedlock. Uh, men's wages are suppressed, even though they do the dirtiest, most dangerous work that there is that allows women to have these phony baloney jobs right? These phony baloney nonsense. I'm an interior decorator. Oh yeah. We need more psychologists and more interior decorators in society. That's really what's going to save us. It's nonsense. It has destroyed everything. It's the single most destructive mm. social revolution of all time. Now tell me why it's been a good thing. Tell me why it's, are you, helpful. are you done virtue signaling? I'm not virtue signaling. Yeah, I'm on my clear, soapbox. Clearly, with, I'm on my soapbox with a signaling. better argument. You're, I've all you're talking about is communism. You're not even talking virtue about Virtue signaling. Feminism. I'm flashing you're back to Gary about... right now. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. I just want you to are all, You are just, you are completely <laughs> talking about communism. I haven't heard anything about feminism. You're talking about, you're citing a communist academic. I don't give a fuck about communism. I'm not a communist. Are you kidding and me? You should tell, you should tell every single academic feminist. Not every single academic. Name a not single feminist every, academic who's a not a Marxist. And this is where it's not. They have a lot of them have socialist ideas or they believe in a robust welfare system because guess what? Women who are stay at home moms who don't have a means of wor working or have been out of work for 10 years raising their kids, when their husband dies, then yeah, they, they need some sort of welfare system to help them get back on their feet until they can provide for their family. Yes. Um, uh, there is going to be more women who, especially feminists, who see social welfare, robust, robust social welfare system as something that is beneficial towards women. But that doesn't mean that we want a communist society. Right. Um, again, I think one of the main focuses of feminism is liberty. And liberty is not something that is technically a communist ideal. Um, uh, secondly, um, 
again, I don't know why you're bringing up like a, a, a just a communist in Russia when we're talking about the feminist movement as a whole. Well, let's talk about liberty. So who votes for less liberty, men or women voters? Who votes to limit people's liberty? Is that the male voters or the women voters? What, well, what do you mean by liberty? Like, uh, so what, what ironically, things? ironically, all the people who said, well, we need to let all the women vote because uh, we want maximum liberty. We want maximum freedom. And so we have to let them vote. OK, they let women vote. What did women vote for? They voted for gun laws restrictions on gun rights. They voted for limits on free speech. They voted for a giant welfare state. They voted for, they, they love the wars. The women generally are out there voting for like a bigger security state. They want the NSA, they want the nanny state. Women always vote for security. They don't vote for liberty. So if you want more liberty, letting women vote is the worst way to have more liberty. Thing number two though, do you think there's a patriarchy still? I don't uh, I don't agree with the term patriarchy. I think that there it like patriarchal societies are a thing, but I'm not even sure in America that I can call it a patriarchal society per se. Um, I think you, in you India think you can call still, it. Do you think men still have generally like more power? I think that um, I think that you would agree with this that men in general are on average stronger, larger than women. Historically, have been able to work outside the home. Um, have historically been able to have more liberties than women. But do you think that it's equal? Do we have an equal power dynamic, or do you still think that men in general are kind of the oppressors, and we have like something of a patriarchy? Do I think that men in general are oppressors? No, I think that um, the average man is not an oppressor. No, I don't think that. Um, do I think? Do I think there's a system which um, is dis disadvantageous to women? Yeah, probably. Okay, how and many also big, working class men? And also, how many big men. strong men would we need to get rid of that system? How many big strong men do we need to take down the patriarchy, I mean, Stardust? Uh, uh, again, I didn't say patriarchy, right? You're the one who said this patriarchy. Is the oppressive system that gives men unfair advantages. How many big strong men do we need? You believe in an oppressive need? system too, Rachel. You do. Yeah, as, you as believe women, in financiers who who push feminism and push Marxism on society. So you believe women, in an oppressive system. How many big strong believe, men do we need wait, you to take down an oppressive this oppressive system, system too? It's the same thing. You believe in an oppressive system too. You just you think that it's uh, it's financiers behind the scenes, right? No, um, I, I, I think secondly, that men being we've in done this through laws now order. because we have women who can vote now. We've done it through laws. By the way, you said it in your own book that um that you know it uh, a, a part of the people who were pushing for women's ability to vote were Christians, were they not? They were, no, they were heretics masquerading as Christians okay. who secretly, yeah, and again, how do you like, know they were heretics? Masquerading how do I know Christians? they were heretics? Yeah. Because they were lesbian pastors, yes, they had that even in the late 1800s. They were Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her two dozen friends who rewrote the Bible from the perspective of feminists. You can still buy it right now on Amazon.com. It's called The Woman's Bible. And they took out all the patriarchal parts they don't like. And in the very beginning, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who told everybody she was a good Christian woman, said, mm -hmm. I don't believe that any man ever spoke to God. I don't believe the Ten Commandments were issued by God. I don't believe Moses saw God. I think the Bible and Christianity is bullshit, but everyone believes it. It's too influential and we can't get rid of it. So what didn't we have to do oh, is the, co opt it. What they did was try to prohibit alcohol, didn't they? Because uh what because of they want the one of the first things that the uh the women's Christian temperance union tried to do was prohibit alcohol because of its effects on society. So I don't know like that. Stanton like, was not a big fan of the Christian Women's Temperance Union. She she worked with some of the leadership who were pro-suffrage. Some of them were mm -hmm. anti-suffrage. She worked with the pro-suffrage groups. But I wouldn't get too keen on the Women's Christian Temperance Union if I were you because they were Marxists and mm -hmm. they united with the Ku Klux Klan and they were mm -hmm. eugenicists. So okay. and they were funded by by Marxist entities who they uh in they fact, were funded again. Yes. Yes, it's Who always funded simp, simp Marxists, simps and Marxists fund all of this stuff. Yes, simps for of Marxists. course, for their own gain. Yeah, because and how is it for women their own are gain so for, easy to manipulate? How is it for their own gain for women to? Well, I'll have tell you, because, power. because you because you and most women these days, this is what you do. You go to 12 years of public school, you get brainwashed. You think mm -hmm. I have to have a degree in order to be successful in life. In order for people to look at me as a su successful woman, I need a college degree. So you take on an average of $40,000 in debt 
to spend your best fertile years getting a bullshit college degree in basket weaving, socialism, fucking women's mm. studies, interior design, some nonsense, some cubicle job. And you come out of it at, you know, 23 and you say to yourself, okay, now I've got to build a career before I can think of having a family because I've been taught and propagandized to believe that I'll be beaten by a man if I don't have my own job and my own money and everything that it will make me vulnerable to abuse. It's just not a good idea. Right. And I've been raised by my boomer parents to think that I have to have this this career first, and then I can have a job. So they spend 10 more years building a career. They're now like 33-ish and they go, oh shit, my biological clock is ticking and I'm about to hit the wall. And if I want to have a baby, I've got to do it quick. And then they're trying to get married and find a guy. And by the time they do, if they're even lucky enough to find one who wants to deal with her college debt and her careerism, mm -hmm. now they're lucky if they can get one, maybe two kids. Oftentimes they need in vitro Didn't to do it. Didn't you just that say that a, women I, had the reproductive power? just a second so you this is what they women do have reproductive power and, and, and women they have the did. ability to choose and they now did. you're saying that okay then yes wh which try to pay it? attention stardust they said that they did have mm -hmm. that they had the mostly they had the power of sexual selection now they say i don't even want to have a family because that's for losers like rachel who just want to stay home with their icky husband and like raise little snot-nosed germ factories all day i want to be a career boss bitch i want to be like taylor mm -hmm. swift I want to be like Beyonce. I want to be like the, uh, you know, Kamala Harris or somebody. And so they devote their life to their career and to their bullshit degree. They're in massive amounts of debt. They mm -hmm. forego kids and family. And now then, and then they sit and cry for the last 40 years of their life or, you know, they become Chelsea Handler. This is uh -huh. so, yeah, this worked really well. Women got okay. propagandized into destroying themselves in society so that they could work in a cubicle and pay income tax and make money for corporations. Tell I would argue wrong. that it I would argue that it's a better thing actually because um divorce rate was going down um last time I checked only um, because nobody's getting married anymore. That's not true. That's not how that statistic yep. works. That is not how that statistic works. It is a percentage of existing marriages that are that that they calculate the divorce rate off of. So less people percentage wise are getting divorced. It's not has nothing to do with pe how many people are getting married. Secondly, if less people, even if less people are getting married and they're waiting longer to get married, I would argue that that's a good thing because we have less people who are going to get married to the wrong person and then end up getting divorced or one part your leaves and then somebody has to file the paperwork so you think that if you wait until you're now the average age of first marriage for a woman in this country is 30 or 31 i think it's mm -hmm. like 31 in the uk and it's like 30 here you think they're waiting till 30 because they're getting the best they can get at 30 you don't think that women have a better selection when they're at their peak fertility at say like 22 23 no, i don't think so because all the men around that period are fucking idiots no, you get you married don't older. Wanna, you get married a few down. years older. So you're 22 Any and you marry a guy who's 28 and established. What's wrong with that? It worked for all of human history and the birth don't rate settle down. It. Most 28-year-old men don't want to settle down. Not now, because with your feminist They never bullshit, did. No, they never did. No, what that's not true. has been the prevailing joke that men have made, have made through all through the decades, right? Is that I hate my bitch wife. Uh, oh, uh, marriage is game over. Um, you know, like, oh, I can't believe he's getting married. It's, it's you know, like he can't do anything now. Men have always that's demonized feminism. Wait, men, no, it's that's not. Men have, uh, it's not that post feminist. Men have always demonized um, marriage. And now that women are making the same joke, of I hate my stupid husband. Now everybody's freaking out. Men have been doing it for decades upon decades upon then why decades did they across the globe. That's bullshit. Then why did they compete throughout all of history to get the best wives? Why was it like did they? men just men killed each other? They fought the biggest wars in history over women. It's like for the for you to sit here and act like oh men never wanted to get married. No, what happened? Is, which wars were were over women? Which wars? Helen were of Troy. Yes. Okay, one. Okay, what's the next one? Okay, what about? How no, no, wait, what's the next one? No, no, what's no. the next war? No, you said men have been fighting wars over women. You I named can't. one war. We're not gonna one war. I would like, like to know what ladies, other wars time. there were that were fought over women. This is pathetic. She hasn't been able is to it? tell me at all how this has benefited society whatsoever. 
feminism feminism good because no. even you haven't can't been able to tell me for more than one war that's women. been about women you're cl making claims that you can't back up yeah, i have to you, ask you for additional you information every time you make a me claim. on history you're gonna every time you make a claim I, I, a I have to put it's like pulling teeth with you 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 ha you don't know your own facts you will make one statement and then not be able to back up your statements how many wars have been over women can you name them for me Women were the main prize for men. They're the reason they'd go fight and in die. War? Okay. Maybe, yes. maybe when they rape and pillage, yeah, women are the no. prize. Take the women, yeah. And they go would rape and pillage. Conf confiscate them. Yeah. That's why chivalry, you know, the code of conduct for knights started being established. But guess what? That's the code of book. conduct for knights, <laughs> right. That's we're going to talk about that. The code of conduct for knights only applied to noble women. It didn't apply to common women. Well, you know, it was like, fuck common women. Um, we can rape and pillage all we want, but you know, as long as it's as long as it's a, a noble woman, then yeah, we have to treat them with respect, with dignity. And guess what? They were usually cucks because they never got with the noble women, anyways, so, because so they were not you, the same social status. You're myopic. You know, you've sat here and insulted this my is intelligence. His, this you've is sat historical. Here Okay, shut up for a second so I can talk. You sat here and insulted my intelligence this whole time. Yes. I haven't heard you say one fucking intelligent thing. You don't have any shit you can back up. This is you an ad hom have, because you you're have platitudes. You're the one who ad hom first. You sit here with your platitudes like, oh, but uh, historically the men were mean. And it's like, I didn't no. say historically the men were mean. I said way more than that. I said that the code of conduct was established for knights because knights did not, they were known as brutes. They were known as thugs. They were basically hired thugs to go and kill people and they had a history of acting that way and then um and then they established a code of conduct a professional code of conduct and that only applied towards noble women it only applied to the nobles so if you're a commoner get fucked you know so they, we so can what rape do you kill think, you know? so, so your what do you think life was like for average women in the time period you're talking about you what think you, that they just was, got what was that life for the average common dollars. woman how the fuck yes. did you get elton john on the kill stream Probably really not great. Probably not great for the common the man stream. either. So but wait, that's you why think, the chivalrous... no, 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 I'm not going to let you get away from this point. You think the average woman, her husband, didn't protect her from brutality. You think that the average woman just couldn't leave her house without getting graped or beaten? What do you uh, think? It, the reason why the chivalrous code was established, you can look this up it, historically. The reason it was established was, be, yes, you wrote about this, so you should know. Yes. I'm surprised, But frankly. those are knights, but, as you said. I'm talking about the common no, no, woman. Nice. You think right. the common the woman just had knights code. coming in and graping her one after the, the next? The chivalrous code was made specifically for knights. It only became widely adopted later. Okay, I'm not even sure that's a good thing. I'm asking you, and let's because you want to talk about medieval times. Do you think that the average woman in medieval times, her husband was not invested in her protection and her welfare? I'm sure he was, but when a knight comes riding in and he uh, is burning your town and looting your town and he can rape your wife, you know, there's not that's much you can war, do. That's war, Stardust. That's war. And that's who war, protects yes. women? Who protects women in the war? See, this is my this is my problem with you and your bullshit on this and every other woman who tries again, this bullshit. Even the common woman one to at the time, nice, even, only one at a time, ladies, one at a time. Go ahead, Rachel. Your only hope of protection from bad men in this world is from good men. Period. End of story. It doesn't yeah. matter what you think about it. It no, doesn't matter if you like that. I'll let her respond. Go ahead. It, maybe it, you maybe can men all day and say what it should be. You no. can say uh, people in hell should have ice water, but they don't. We're talking about what is. Okay. Now, you can say what are, but I'm telling you that All right. you're only the people your that knights are supposed to protect. Even if you oh, look at the people that knights are supposed to protect, they protected and they were nice to noble women. When it came to common women, they were not that way. When it came to the commoner, they were not that way. Okay. I'm often, going to... Oftentimes, it would be at the expense of commoners. Is there anywhere I can drop a link, Ralph? Uh, yeah, you could throw it in the in the uh, hangout chat. Yeah. Okay. Let's if you see, see if it, I can you find see a little that. chat box that should be. Next yeah, I do. The, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is a piece from my Substack, which goes over mm -hmm. something called the National Incident Study. Now, this is the federal government's primary huge study that they do. Um, every 10 to 15 years since the 1970s. There's been several of them mm -hmm. done for the last 45 years. This data from the government, which goes over, um, they, they collect data from emergency rooms, women's battered shelters, CPS, mm -hmm. any organization that deals with abuse of women and children. Mm -hmm. And it shows that far and away, 
the safest situation for women is with a married husband. Same for children. Children with both biological married parents in the home, it's by a factor of 12, the safest situation for them. I don't dispute them. that. Just a second. When women go into cohabitation, when they have second marriages, when they just mm -hmm. uh, live with their boyfriend, or even when they're just single and, and not affiliated with a man at all, or if they're in a lesbian relationship, all of these situations are more dangerous for abuse, not just from men, but from other women. Also, the national incident studies show that the primary threat to children is not men. It's not their dads. It's their mothers. No, it's mothers. women with postpartum depression. No, it's not, it's not just, no, it's not. It's not women with postpartum depression. It's women as a whole, as a monolith. Now, feminists tried to say for decades, that's because women spend the most time with the children. But we are seeing now in the last 20 years that men are spending on average about four times more time with their children than they did back in the 70s and 80s when they first started doing is these that studies. Still, is that still more than women, though? It's not more than women, but here's the thing. Here's why this can't be true. If it were just a matter of women spending the most time with the children, making them the abusers, mm -hmm. we would see that as men gained more parenting time, that men would take more of a share of the abuse. And we do not see that. What we do see, and this is what psychologists say when they tear this data apart, they say, the reason women tend to be more abusive is because they're more prone to mental illness, they're more mm -hmm. emotionally unstable, and because they are weaker than men and they don't learn the dynamics of force, like young boys learn this rough and tumble play to learn where the limits mm -hmm. of things are, mm -hmm. women don't tend to learn the limits of when they lose their temper. So when they are the strong person, so when it's mommy who's big and strong and a little bitty toddler or a five-year-old, they don't know how to control themselves. And then that uh, mental illness and emotional instability factor kicks in and they're far more likely to use force multipliers and to cause more damage. So what I'm saying in short is that when women have the use of force at their advantage, they're more likely to be abusive than men are. So okay. this idea that men are the enemy, men are like the bad guys, we have to watch out for the men is bullshit. Okay, it's when really did I say true. that? When did I say specifically that? Uh, well, you, what you I will say, to, wait a minute. What yeah, I will say, finish what this I will topic say, and then I want to move it on to a little bit okay. more modern uh, times right. here. Uh, so you know, a little bit, but but go ahead. This, okay? I am not against two family homes. You're right. By every measure of statistics, uh, sorry, not two family, two, two two parent per, homes. Yeah, by right. every by every measure in statistics, two parent homes are far superior to single parent homes, right? And obviously, when a father is involved with his children, that is going to be a much superior home life than one where the father is not involved. And I would go yes. so far to say that, you know, um, this actually goes counter to your point, right? About women um, abusing children. It seems that when men are involved in these, uh, in these homes, that uh, it seems that like there's there's less abuse if they're a good partner, right? But when it comes no, to nobody said it, if they're a good partner and who decides that you snuck that in. Okay, you but when they, no, but yeah, no, I'm not trying to sneak it in. I, I, I let me finish with my point here, right? We still need, we still need um a lot of the times. So you've got all these kids who have all of these issues, right? Um and uh and because they're raised in single family homes, right? Something like 27% of men um, post-divorce completely cease all contact from their children. That in itself is a problem, and they do it of their own volition. Um, That's the, not it, always it, true, Stardust. I'll say not Just always, not, not always but anyways, true. But I'm but talking yes. about specifically. I'm talking about specifically right. the statistics of men who who specifically cut all contact from their children, not out of the state enforcing them, them just abandoning. So that in itself is an issue. So yes, it's always going to be better to have a two parent household, but men are the ones who are um, uh, disproportionately doing infidelity. Men are the ones who are no. doing 84%. Where, where are you getting that? 84% of all violent crimes are done by men. Um, Two so other men, to other to men. Our, but it's still First of all, we gotta, by, no, we got to go still, back a second because you men. just said infidelity still, is primarily male. That's not the statistics I've seen. All the statistics I've seen in the last three years have said mm -hmm. that it's roughly equal, that women okay. cheat the roughly equal on par with men. The statistics that I have seen show that when they have a satisfied sex life, when they have a satisfied emotional life, a satisfactory marriage, women um, think of cheating 5% of the time, whereas men will think about cheating 20% of the time. So, so that is 
so that that is that is huge. That How is, is that huge. biological? No, it's though. not. Who actually it could be biological? It could be biological. But what is the reason for these marriages not working? I would again argue that women waiting a longer time to get married is going to be beneficial for their family in the long run. All right. Okay. What is now? This do you want to answer this, with... Rachel? And then I have a question that I want to get to both of you. Yeah, I I just still want to know why, if we're looking at the state of things, okay, pre and post feminism. I brought this up in debates even with you before Stardust. There's been two big studies done, one call, uh, called the Paradox of Female Happiness, and then there was a follow-up to that study done several years later where they did a bigger sample size. They looked all across the world in different cultures, and they found that women everywhere, regardless of the time, the era, the place, the circumstances, are just generally unhappier than men. You can't fucking make women happy, okay? We're emotional. We have a ton of hormones that fluctuate not only every day and every month, but all throughout the years and decades of our lives. We're just generally more neurotic, we're more prone to dysphoria. We're more prone to depression and mental illness of every kind. You can't build a world around making women happy. That's not how shit works. And we don't build the world around making men it's happy. Not making, most, yeah, it's not about making men happy. Yeah, well, because you're kind of making this case that like, oh, well, feminism is good because now women have the choice to have some stupid cubicle career or they can like leave uh, For me, it's never marriage. been about happiness. For me, it's never been about happiness. Well, it's what's been about, it about? Is it about outcomes? It's, because no, you're it's not about outcomes. I, I specifically said equality of opportunity. The reason okay. why I am a feminist is because I am for women's safety. I just got done explaining to you that women are far and away safest when they're married to a man and stay a good man. Even if it's not a particularly happy, like, oh, my emotional needs are being met. I don't get flowers on my birthday, all this bullshit. They're I'm not still talking about that. safer and more secure when they're married to a man and stay in the damn marriage. It's always been better for women. All the statistics unanimously, there's not even like an argument about this, that it's better for women. They're not happier being single cubicle cat ladies. 26% of women are now on antidepressants of some okay, kind. So I, I will agree with you that it is good when a woman is with a man who is good to her. And when I say good to her, that is very broad. I'm talking about a man who does not abuse her, right? But you can look at statistics, something like 30% um, of female victims of murder, um, were killed by an intimate partner. That is huge. When yeah, uh, and lesbian relationships, lesbian relationships are far and away the most violent type of living situation that there is. So I want to ask you because this is all kind of thirty four percent of female victims who are who are killed by an intimate partner are majority being killed by a, a they're being killed by people that they should be safe with. They're not. But but separating all women from the men who have the most vested interest in their well-being which would be their fathers their husbands their not brothers that's not going to make them safer and this i just got done explaining that the statistics bear that out and you want to you like all women you want to go to outlier situations to prove your case now i want to know what metric 34 percent is a huge um, amount what of metric? The women who die from homicide 34 percent is a huge amount that is so that is not an outlier when a when such how many women die person, from homicide and how many more die from homicide when they're not even in when they're not even married like i said if you're going to be a victim of intimate partner violence it's going to be from your boyfriend who you live with or your boyfriend who you don't live with or, or your from husband. your girlfriend or from your no your husband is the least likely person statistically I just let I just oh, linked oftentimes, it in the time for you. oftentimes for women, the most uh, in especially in abusive relationships, the most um, a lot of a lot of women, as soon as they get pregnant, the abuse will ramp up or will start for the first time. Most yeah, women again, who you're, experience you're women, just most, talking most about women, when this happens. most women, most women who experience domestic violence, like not most, sorry, a good portion of women who experience domestic violence experience it for the first time when they are pregnant. This has nothing to do. This has nothing to do with what we're talking about because it, it kind again, of does. Though you're talking about no, you're talking about men uh, uh, abusing women. We're talking about, and I again, I don't disagree with you. When a woman is married to a guy who is not crazy, no, I'm talking about on average. 
we and can't that, talk about Mike your little where you want to tuck it away and, and make it this little, little subsect. It's I'm not, saying it's overall, like, well, it's overall, 30%. and no, overall and in general, the vast majority of marriages are not abusive. And among men who abuse, husbands are the least likely. Again, so, I'm not so saying feminism, that, which I'm not saying the vast don't majority. Get married, I'm not saying the vast majority of marriages don't get married. are abusive. Convinced. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the that it's a significant amount. Three, are you going to let me it, talk? Are, are, are you going to just are gonna, are gonna keep rambling? In. Are you going to keep rambling and virtue Let, signaling? I'm not the one rambling. You're rambling and virtue signaling. Not You're me. You're the one who talks for five abused. minutes at a time, Rachel. Most you women talk are for not five abused. minutes at a time. I'm not saying most women are abused. I, you're putting words in my mouth again. Do you follow what I'm saying? Can you comprehend? Do you understand words? What metric are you using to try to demonstrate that feminism has improved the conditions for women? Is it outcomes? Are so, you looking at outcomes? I am looking at laws passed, right? Um, the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993 was No, no, one. no. You're not understanding my question. I'm asking you, what, what metric are you using to look at the overall situation and say, mm -hmm. look, we can take a look at the last 100 years or 50 years and see that by these measurements, life is, is it a philosophical thing for you? Is it outcome based? Like what kind of epistemology it's, it's are you a, using? It's a, mix. it's a mix, right? But women's education is something that a lot of feminists will push. And it's all, wait, okay. wait a minute, let me finish. Sure, you can cut me off. When sure, you're asking ahead, me to answer ahead. your question go and ahead. you don't want my answer because Fucking gonna... go ahead. Okay. All right. Are you you're gonna ramble for another five minutes, Rachel? Are you gonna ask me questions that are stupid? Okay. Ladies, Women's please. education. Women's education. Like one of the things that feminists will very much push is women's education. And you can look at statistics from UNICEF when you invest in girls' education, lifetime earnings of girls dramatically increase, national growth rates increase, child marriage rates decrease, child mortality rates fall, maternal mor mortality rates fall, and child stunting drops. Um, and you can look at um, the laws that have been passed, right? Um, Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993 in the United States um, allowed people to take um, uh, unpaid leave for family or medical reasons without worrying about their job security you've got the labor movement feminists were huge in pushing against child labor um because believe it or not women have always worked but also so have children and it was really bad for them um uh you can um you know look at again maternal mortality has gone down in america even um yeah as i, I did to feminism or Medical. Uh, I was going to rebut her. Her. I would like wait, to. Wait, 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 wait. Let me talk. ask her. Let me ask her, and then I'll let you respond. I swear. I swear. Is that feminism, because of feminism, yeah. or is that because of medical it's probably, uh, advancement? It's probably a mix of because feminists do advocate for um, more investment in women's health care. So. Okay. All right. Now go ahead, Rachel. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. You cited education. Women were above men in educational achievement since mm -hmm. 1790 when the U.S. government started keeping track. Women had higher literacy rates, higher mm -hmm. high school graduation rates. As soon as uh, they got the right to vote, they started to graduate from college more. But that's if you look back before suffrage, most men never went to college. It was like 4% of men who ever went to university. University used to be something for only very a very small population of really gifted people who needed higher education. Now it's become a government scam where they just hand out loans to retards who want bullshit degrees so that they can pay it till they die, okay? So that's mm -hmm. number one. Feminism did not help women's education. It made women the primary debt holders of college debt. That's all it did. OK, there's a reason why even after 50 years of feminism, men and women, there is still a, a wage gap. And the reason for the wage gap is women pick retarded stuff to get a degree in. They pick jobs that pay less and are easier. They want to work less hours. They aren't as resilient health wise. And they're like, oh, I have my period and I have to take extra days off or I have a cold and I'm not coming in today, whereas men will work themselves into the ground especially if they're trying to support a family. So if we're looking at outcomes, you want to play this nonsense where it's like, well, I want to have my cake and eat it too. And I just want to say, uh, these are all correlates of things that I think might be better, but almost everything you listed is just a consequence of better technology. So like better outcomes in women's health and things like that 
are almost always due to stuff like more access to antibiotics, uh, more access to, um, you know, clean water, things like that. It's those things are due to technology, not due to women's lib. What feminism has done, if you want to look at outcomes, you can look at things like I just mentioned 26 American women are on some kind of psychiatric prescription drug. That's mind blowing. Okay. You can look at the fact that women are now the primary debt holders. We have, we go into our fertile years holding debt, which is why the birth rates are so low. Birth rates, when I talk about that, I'm not just talking about white people, by the way. I love how the left wants to always act like I'm some kind of like anything, Nazi person. No, I'm just for, about the, that. for the audience who's watching, birth rates are down everywhere except for a tiny little bit of, of East Africa and Israel. And the only reason they're not below replacement in Israel is because of their IVF program. So Korea now has a 0.78 birth rate. The average Korean woman won't even replace herself. And as I said, if you care about like well-being and outcomes, this is catastrophic. We're already seeing supply chain interruptions, labor shortages. The Canadian and Japanese governments are now encouraging people to self-delete if they have depression or any kind of chronic illness or if they're just a little bit old. Um, you're, what you're getting under feminism is a dystopian world that might end the species and you're like yeah but they can but they can have jobs though they can have jobs though so wait, again, wait, why I do i want them to have the given ability everything to have we've jobs. traded given everything we've traded what are we getting for feminism do you, do you remember why i would like women to have the opportunity ha to have jobs if they need it do you remember my reasoning for that they had the opportunity to have jobs before they've Not always the same way. Stardust, you said they've always been able to work outside the home, and then you said we need feminism so they can not work outside this, the home. Not Which in the same it? way. Not in the same what way. What do you mean in the same way? They can't be CEOs. They can't be Again, a boss. I it? said this at the beginning. I said this at the beginning, right? But women have always worked. They just worked in very specific jobs, and those jobs are not always going to be the most, um, uh, uh, you know, conducive to having family or making enough money to support a family, especially if a partner dies or becomes disabled or anything like that. Secondly, I think that you had just you have completely dismissed anything that I said that feminism has advocated for and just said, well, you know, that's just because of technology. Well, it guess is. what? Social pressure also has something to do with what we invest our time into. So when we invest our time into women's health and reducing maternal mortality and reducing child mortality, that that is going to their results. Yes, obviously technology is part of the reason, but advocacy is one of those reasons too. Otherwise, we well, could just we could write off anything as the result of better technology. Um, in fact, why do we even need men? Because we have better technology. I'm not, I'm not going around saying that, right? Obviously, men and women still have very distinct differences, and what men uh, can do is very different from what women can do. But uh, you made this point about women taking on massive college debt. Well, I mean, so do a lot of dudes. Um, uh, women, yes, they might t pick a lot of really stupid degrees. So do a decent amount of men. Um, no, that's not what the data says. And let me just blow out your little argument here about child mortality. Do you know that the United States is one of the only developed nations that has a rising mortality rate? And do you know why that is? Thing. Do you know why? Why? because they're having babies so freaking old now and it's dangerous because feminists it's tell them dangerous. wait until you've had your career no, yes, that's the to, reason the any, reason for the rise in child doctor. mortality and maternal mortality is because women are now waiting until 35 or later when they're not when they're barely probably most to likely to due to accessibility of healthcare facilities nope, and accessibility not. of healthcare you can providers look do you want me to get the source for you real quick do you think sure, i'm just going to come on here and me. bullshit okay I do think you're going to come on here and bullshit because you bullshit about everything else like satanism no i being don't tied i back feminism. up everything i say do you have do any you? books do you have any academic articles you've written that are sourced that are vetted oh, by oh, i'm sorry i have to write no, 150 don't. page so i'm not going to sit here with and hear this bullshit from you that i'm lying you, you you homeschool your kids and your your book was filled with spe spelling errors like I, I don't know what to do dude like i don't know what to say it was it was when it first came out and that's been fixed 
Okay. It was right. when it well, first maybe came out shouldn't because have been I published didn't, I unless published. you spell checked it, right? Maybe you shouldn't have maybe you shouldn't have put uh, it out initially. I didn't think anyone was going to read it. I didn't know it was going to be a bestseller multiple times over. Oh, okay. So as soon as it came out and I caught the few errors, so we was, don't think I we don't it. think that we we have a standard for the information our, is our, correct. Our, you know, the source we don't have a standard for for the quality of work oh. we put out because we think that nobody's going to see it. I thought it was going to be for my kids. I thought it was going to be like kind of for my kids. Oh, okay. um, but let's look here. Um, here we go. High and rising mortality rates um, in women. I have this on my phone, but I don't know how to share it. Like, you know, right here, right now. A screen share. Yeah. There is a screen share. Um, if you see the little okay. present now button yeah here's the here's the one and it's even got it highlighted so um yes this is from the cdc and it tells you right here that um the rising mortality rates for 2021 based on the data that uh, maternal mortality rates by age group and by gender and it tells you the all the stuff how they did the study and it says that the main reason for this is due to the overall increase in maternal age so let me just go ahead and copy this yeah. and plop it in the chat so yes no it's not because of limited access to health care everybody has fucking access to health care give me a break even not the most... in rural america not in yes rural america. i'm in rural america i'm not in every part of rural america no they don't they, it is an actual america. it is an actual recognized problem within the healthcare industry that they've done we studies all, on that accessibility is a problem the poor rural people all get medicaid they get plenty of health care not talking the, about medicaid i'm talking about actual accessibility to facilities no, right the rise in mortality rate nowhere, the cdc okay she's nowhere. gonna sit here and argue with me when the cdc tells her right here that the reason mortality rates are rising for the first time in like a hundred years of course it's not lack of access to health care you think suddenly nobody has access to health care but they did a hundred years ago obviously not that's retarded it's okay, because average maternal age is so high it was never this high and i'm telling you she's saying she's gonna sit here and say the species ending event of women just deciding to not ever bear children or if they do they have one when they're 40 that this is fine it's no, fine because well is fine. you know women need to be able completely to work. fine we have we have better technology as you said we have better technology now so you know yes if, and if you if you haven't ever have, looked up what happens when you have population decline it's a fucking nightmare because this technological world that gives you all these advantages is going to disappear because there won't be anyone to keep the infrastructure going. There's nobody to build and maintain this world. Women just think that they just wake mm. up and they flip on the light switch and the lights just come on and it's fucking magic. It's just black magic. It just does it all by itself. No, it's built by men. The technology that has increased and, and made life better for women, reduced infant mortality, reduced maternal mortality, made lifespans longer, medicine, all these things, that's all men. Men build it, men maintain it. And if it all, if the men all disappeared tomorrow, all of it would be gone. Literally within 24 hours, you'd have a mass extinction event. Now, if women disappeared tomorrow, that would not be the case. It actually it absolutely wouldn't be would be. Yeah, it, would it absolutely not. would. You would have a protracted issue of not being able to reproduce. If you, like if the women just disappeared, you'd have a protracted issue. But within 24 hours, you wouldn't have a mass die-off event. Like the, you would. The, the education, the medical force. Are you kidding yes, me? We the wouldn't medical have force? kindergarten teachers and psychologists. I'm not talking about psychologists. I'm talking about medical professionals, nurses and doctors, right? Like the, the, a huge portion of that industry would be completely gone. That is absolutely an essential uh, job to have that men women fill disproportionately. Job, but do men they can do, do those jobs. Can, men can do it, but do they do it? They, if women disappeared, yes, they could just they, jump right in and do it. They probably wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. They probably wouldn't. <laughs> and they probably so, wouldn't be as good no, as I, women. This isn't something it. I they came up with. These are... Good, that, is for this probably wouldn't be they probably wouldn't be as good a, as women at it because as you and i both like to acknowledge women are better when it comes to taking care of people are they though they are the statistics at least now, for female do doctors why, bear out. why do women kill all their babies why are women the ones that <laughs> kill and abuse all the children and abort all the babies if they're so nurturing and they're so caretaking um how do you explain that i mean the abortion thing is probably going to be some another thing that we will argue about and disagree about but 
when it comes to um, abusing children, obviously that's bad, but it seems to happen disproportionately to people who are poor. It seems to happen to disproportionately people who have substance abuse issues in the that family. That doesn't explain why they're women. No, when women, are the pri- women. when women are the primary caretakers and they are specifically affected by poverty uh, and specifically affected by substance abuse, and I think we both would acknowledge that there is a substance abuse epidemic in America, then yeah, th- it is going to bear out. that doesn't disproportionately affect women. So how do you explain the disparity that when because men have- women disproportionately caretake after children no, and the poor I... ones who, who, the poor ones who are doing that are going to it, the abuse is going to bear out that way. So we're back to the we're back to the 50 year old Democrat narrative that it's not the person, it's the poverty, it's not the right. So how do you explain the disparity that when we equalize parenting time, mm-hmm. when dads have the same parenting equal? time as moms, they are less likely to abuse? How is it? How is it equal though? Is it equal? I'm saying if you if you if equalize we do, the data but how way. do but how do you know that? How do you know if we equal equalize proportionally? It? So uh, the Substack piece I just linked, if mm-hmm. you scroll down, it explains this paradox that feminists used to say it's because women are the primary caretakers we just and they've got too much on their plate and that's why they abuse. So now we that just we just talked see, about this though, right? Yeah, and, and I, I said, said I said specifically that men have still not reached the same level of caretaking taking that women have. We don't but, know. But, but and men still, men still commit the vast majority of violent crimes. This woman is going to sit here and say, I'm stupid, but she doesn't understand what proportion means. It means that even if 70% of women have custody and only 30% of men have custody, that per capita, the women are still more abusive to the children than the men. And the reasoning for that is the women are more prone to mental illness and emotional They're more instability. prone to poverty as well. When, uh, if you look at like the, the statistics Only post-divorce, post-separation. Oh, right, right, exactly. But why but do they leave? Leaving? But why who's leaving leave? the marriage? The women. 70, the women are 80%. filing the divorce. The women are filing the divorce. That doesn't mean they're the ones that are leaving. Oftentimes, it'll be a man has been stepping out for a while, and the woman finally comes to the conclusion that she needs to file the paperwork. Women On file average, the majority. That's not women the reason file, they do. Women file the majority of divorce papers, right? But that doesn't mean that they are the ones who are in, initiating it. There is usually a breakdown of the relationship beforehand. Right. But when we have lawyers and law firms that do Mm -hmm. surveys, the Mm -hmm. women themselves do not report that infidelity is the main reason. And they do not report that the man is the one responsible. It's usually bullshit like I outgrew him. No, because the man will be stepping out. I will have been stepping out for over a year by the time she files for paperwork. She didn't want to get a divorce, but he's stepping out the entire time. No, no, no. One of the top reasons women give for divorce now Mm -hmm. is that they feel like their husband is holding them back and their their family and their husband's holding them back from their career. It's one of the top three answers. The other ones are, I outgrew him or I needed to go find myself. I needed to put myself first. It's shit like that. Infidelity is like fifth or sixth usually on the list. And again, it's pretty equal. The amount of women versus men who cheat is roughly equal, especially, by the way, did you ever think about this? Maybe women working all day in the workforce with men might be more conducive to the breakdown of marriages because you're putting men and women together in the bullpen all the time. And you know what's interesting to me, you're willing to, you're willing to say this about women working and this is going to lead to infidelity, but there's something wrong with young women being in the workforce and finding a partner, finding a long-term husband or, or romantic partner, while in, which happens a lot in the workforce, right? Yeah, so that's there's- fine. I, I said at the beginning of this, single women working is fine, especially for that reason. But married women do not need to be out in the workforce workforce they should be in the home and they should be raising the next generation of children because we're the only ones who can do that we're the only ones so now let me we're the only ones who can do that but you just Mm -hmm. said that oh okay if we lose all women and lose the education force that there's nothing going there's nothing wrong with that 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 no that's not what i said what i said was if all women disappeared tomorrow you have 
a protracted event. It wouldn't be good. Of course, I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying it would be a long protracted event that would be wouldn't bad. Be protracted, but if but, men okay. disappeared tomorrow, you would have mass extinction within 24 hours. Women would just, people would just die because men do all the things that keep society running. This is true. It's a fact. You can't even debate me on that. You know, it's true. Okay. So but women, ask, again, being nurses are doing a huge amount of work in keeping people alive. Men can and, be nurses and men were nurses before women men, were nurses. Men are, men are not correct being nurses and being a nurse requires a lot of training and schooling which men would have to go through before they can be a nurse it would be a again yeah you're just making a point that doesn't refute my point all you're saying is well yeah it would be bad though and i said yeah, i mean of i think we'll be bad. die pretty we, in droves how many, if how many disappeared people would die? From the hospital, how many so. what percentage of the population do you think would fucking die off within 24 hours if men disappeared versus women disappeared I don't think it's going to be a huge amount initially, but if we're talking about people in hospitals, like there's going to be an no, issue. No, we're there. talking about worldwide. We we have a, a one of the Protestants are right, and God raptures all the men only, and it's just women left on the planet. Mm -hmm. How how many of what percentage of the population do you think would die off within? 24 we have technology hours? now. We have technology now. And who runs the technology? Not women. Not women start us. There are who women who the know how to run it. Going? There are women who, who keeps... know how to do it. No, women who can train other women. This is so hilarious, you guys. Okay, no. if men disappeared tomorrow, do you think the lights would be on? Do you think cell yes. communications, you think telecommunications would stay up? Yes. Do you, do you have any women idea? Who don't understand have you how ever these taken a look at the data of how who runs the telecom industry? It who runs the electrical men. power grid? I'm not Nuclear you on a power plant. Primarily men, but there's still women out there who know how it works. You're gonna take the Nina approach and tell me that in a so like a hurricane hits Florida and wipes out the power grid. You think the strong, independent women are gonna go get the lights back on? It they might, but it's gonna take a longer time. It's gonna take a longer time. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Okay, so there's massive flooding in this hurricane area. Are the women going to go in and rescue all the people who are trapped on the buildings? Yes, it will take a longer time. It'll be harder, but they'll do it. Okay, and, you know, the building materials that we're going to need to rebuild Florida, like timber, mm -hmm. are the women going to go and work as timber workers? They will do it. They have done it before where they fill where there is a need. It might take them longer, but they will do it. Uh-huh. Okay, that's very interesting. I don't think I need to say anything else. All right, now let me ask you this. Uh, and um, I forget who I started with now. It's been a long day. I had my own blood sports right before this that I didn't plan. <laughs> um, I'm looking at, um, by the way, in reasons why women initiate divorce. I do have a question, one, though, that I want to wrap. We, we still got plenty. We still got as much time as we need, but I, I do have a, a final kind of encapsulating question that I want to ask. But go ahead, Stardust. I don't want to cut you off. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, again, like, number one is, like, unmet needs. Um, two is deficient life-work balance. Three is husband's unfaithfulness. Four is alcohol addiction. Five is physical and emotional violence. Six is better support system. And seven is fewer regrets. These are reasons why women initiate divorce. And I don't know if this is addressing just the fact that there are a lot of women who will file the paperwork and not necessarily even wanted the divorce right so now let me ask you this uh stardust what have been or has been uh, the top five benefits of feminism uh to modern society i mean i think the advocacy for education is a pretty big one but even if you look at um like traditional you know, patriarchal societies that exist today, um, I would say that they are still in need of feminism, right? There's like a rape crisis in India. Um, there is a rape crisis in a lot of Asian countries as well. Um, and uh, I think as far as like when it comes to feminism, like um, uh, advocacy for, for women's health, advocacy for women's education, um, women being more easily able to support themselves in, in case something goes wrong, um, uh, you know, advocacy against uh, domestic violence. And, th and these are things that go for men as well, um, because feminists have pushed for the acknowledgement and the advocacy for um, male domestic violence survivors. So now let me ask you this, Rachel, what have been the top five negative effects of feminism uh since it's kind of become a thing uh i guess what 50 60 years ago however long 
I don't know. Uh, I'd say since the, the 60s, I guess. Yeah. 60s, yeah. The number one concern is the birth rate. If you look at birth rates, um, they started to decline a bit um, going into the Industrial Revolution. But after suffrage, they dropped like a rock. And then after the birth control pill became widely available in 1965 and we had the sexual revolution, it it dropped below replacement and it's never recovered. Um, I would say abortion would be number two because it's probably the greatest genocide ever perpetrated on the human race. Um, the third one would be fatherless homes because if you look at children who come from fatherless homes, they are at exponentially higher risk for everything from being homeless to having addiction problems, ADHD and learning disabilities, economic disadvantage, um, what more likely to end up in a juvenile facility or have a criminal history later in life, um, more likely to be divorced later in life. I mean, every possible risk factor goes up exponentially when you come from a fatherless home. And then I would say also the uh, switch from a family wage to an individual wage has been pretty catastrophic. It's one of the reasons that we have such a difficult labor market and nobody can afford things right now is because of the effect of taking mothers and just shoving them into the workforce and almost doubling it. If you look at the workforce from like 1960 to 1980, it almost doubled in like 20 years. That's huge. We Humans can't adapt that fast to that massive of a change. And so now even women who want to stay home with their kids have a really hard time doing that because we, we just don't have a family wage anymore. That's why in the fifties, a janitor could support like a family of four on his income and have like a single house with like a car. You can't do that anymore. Now it's like uh, people are struggling just to get an apartment. And that's one of the reasons why. Um, and then I would say the other thing is um, just the massive rise in the welfare state. If you look at the number of out of wedlock births from 1960 to now, and then you look at welfare spending over that same period, they go up on a graph in lockstep like this. They're they're completely parallel to each other. So we wouldn't have this giant nanny state, this huge welfare state, this uh, overbearing income tax system um, without that. Now, I'll, I'll ask one more and then I'll give you guys your, your, your final uh Final uh, points here. It's about 10 minutes, however long you want. Um, but Stardust, would you say there, and I'm going to ask the reverse question to you after, Rachel, but Stardust, would you say there have been any negative impacts uh, of feminist ideology over the... Uh, yeah, I have a huge problem with like um, uh, pop feminism kind of becoming a thing um, because I think it really watered things down and people are more easily able to make like caricatures of what feminism is um, when really, um, again, feminists are just notorious for arguing amongst each other um, about um, uh, about you know different issues within that. Um, I do think also, you know, like um, the feminists who actually believe that all men are evil, like that is a bad thing uh, <laughs> that gives us a bad name and I don't agree with it. Um, and I think any, um, any feminist who continues to perpetuate myths like men can't be abused, men can't be raped, men, um, you know, uh, are, you know, always going to rape and kill you. You know, those are, those are harmful things. If you want to establish trust between the genders, between the sexes, uh, that type of rhetoric is not going to fly. So. Now, Rachel, um, again, reverse question. Have there been any positive impacts uh, from the uh, increased influence of feminist ideology over the past, I don't know, like I said, 60 years? Um, I, I would love to be able to say yes, but I would have to say no. And I've thought about this a lot because I want to be fair and I don't want to come off as being somebody who's just like, I'm here to be the, the anti-feminist lady because I know that's what everybody thinks I am. But to be honest, I don't think, I think that anything that people look to and say this is a benefit of feminism, for the most part, part has been conflated with advances in technology, which again, are male driven. Men want to create a nicer, better world for women and children. We know that, uh, you know, feminists like to say men are these evil people who've always just wanted to like keep us oppressed and controlled and, you know, lock us in the bedroom so that we can be their little toys or whatever. But if that were the case, Historically, you wouldn't see fathers and husbands willing to go to war to protect the homeland, to protect their families. You wouldn't see them willing to risk their lives to defend women from attackers and intruders. You wouldn't see them build this technologically advanced world that, you know, most men are happy to live under a bridge and the only kind of technological advances they want are like 
you know, cool video games and faster cars and stuff like that. But they, they build a lot of this technically advanced world for the purposes of being able to have families and children and make life comfortable for their wives. You know, they created all the wonderful things in my house that make my housewifing a lot easier. So um, I don't think there has been anything positive. And I think personally, and some people may agree, disagree with me, but I think it's because there's no going to be no side benefit to a satanic inversion of the natural order that God created other than hedonistic pleasure. So I guess the only thing you could argue is uh, there's a lot of people out there who can indulge in hedonistic uh, pleasures because of feminism. That'd be all I could come up with. Now, Rachel, I think I started with you. I may be wrong. Do we, do we start with you? Uh, I, I, I can't, think so. I think so. Okay. So uh, I'll let you start here. I'll let start us finish then, because that's how I always do it. Um, okay. Give your give your final points. Is there any middle ground? Is there any way back in your opinion? Is there anything, um, perhaps some some type of compromise, or is it just we have to roll all this back and and go go back to the way things were? Um, I don't think it's about like trying to go back to a certain time. This is something that a lot of us who are like traditionalists or whatever you want to call us on like the right they think we want to go back to the 50s or we want to go back to you know pick your time period we want to go back it's not really about going back and i don't think you can go back um but i do think feminism is completely unsustainable i that's why i opened kind of saying i think this will be a blip in history that two thousand five thousand years from now uh people will look back and say that was a funny thing they tried and it didn't work because we are looking at the implosion of worldwide birth rates. We're looking at the implosion of the fabric of society. Um, you would not have the LGBT nonsense, the trans nonsense without feminism. It all came from feminism. In fact, some of the earliest feminists going back to Flora Tristan, uh, Margaret Fuller in the early 1800s, they were already coming up with prototypical versions of transgenderism, of gender abolition. They were hoping for a future where women could be biologically the same as men. So you would not have this LGBT nonsense if it weren't for feminism coming first. And yes, there are trans exclusionary radical feminists who don't like it, but I kind of just look at them and I say, well, you did this to yourself. You are going to have to eat the crow because you are the ones that enabled this by trying to pretend, like Stardust does, that men and women are interchangeable widgets, that we can't, you know, the women can rebuild the power grid. The women are going to do the timber work. They're going to do the extremely dangerous power line work. They're going to rebuild stuff if, if something gets wiped out. That's never been the case, and it's never going to be the case. Women don't even want to shovel their own driveway, let alone rebuild civilization. So that's it's silly nonsense that's an obvious pipe dream, right? So I like just my closing would be, I don't think we've gotten, even if you think we've gotten something out of it, I think we really all got screwed. I think women got screwed royally by feminism. I think we got sold a bill of goods. We got told that, hey, all the problems you have as women, that you could be abused, that you could end up in a bad marriage, that you could end up impoverished and in need of help, um, that the feminism is going to fix these things. And that's not what we see. We see, as Stardust admitted herself, that women are more likely to be impoverished and live under the poverty line after a divorce, after leaving a marriage, that single women are economically, financially, uh, physically and mentally more vulnerable than their married counterparts. They also report lower happiness indexes than their married counterparts. And feminism has permanently pitted men against women and made us competitive with each other rather than cooperative with each other. And so now we're stuck with, you know, uh, this mental health crisis that we're all dealing with. We are seeing the southern border crisis happening right now. It's not going to be women who go down there and defend the border. Are you kidding me? Like this is, let's stop pretending that there's no differences, significant ontological and anthropological differences between men and women that must be respected. Otherwise, it's going to be the ruin of our entire species. Like that's how bad it is. That's why I wrote the damn book because it's not just like, oh, gee whiz, it's a, you know, there's a little bit more divorce, but at least the women can have their jobs and at least Beyonce and Taylor Swift can, you know, be famous and Kylie Jenner can make a ton of money. No, this is nonsense. It's literally ending humanity as we know it uh on every level that i just explained so that's 
that's kind of my closing. Now you go ahead, start us, and I'll give you both a chance to promote your stuff uh, at the end too. But uh, you go ahead, start us. Future of feminism. I ask the same thing. Is there any type of um, compromise here, or are we just headed uh, towards, um, uh, I guess, increased feminist thought, increased feminist uh, um, enactment of that ideology? Uh, has it gone far enough? Um, and I'll let you get your closing points, and I'll let you both you ladies promote uh, after this very fiery debate, which I know it would be. Uh, go ahead, Sardas. Okay, yeah. So um, I do want to start off and say um, – you know, I think that there is um, an inherent difference biologically between men and women. And because of that, we do need um, feminism to advocate uh, for women um, because they are always going to be at a disadvantage biologically. Secondly, um, uh, I do think that women, when uh, asked to step up, will step up if there is a crisis and they are needed. It might take them longer. They might need more training. It you know, might be more of a struggle for them, but they will step up and they will do it. Uh, thirdly, I disagree with Ra what Rachel said about, um, uh, you know, uh, she implied that I said that um, stay-at-home moms are happier, uh, with, with husbands are happier or something like that than um, single mothers. No, single, single parent households are obviously going to have worse outcomes than a two-parent household. But when you look at stay-at-home moms versus working moms, um, it, it, and you look at um, the statistics around that, stay-at-home moms are more likely to be depressed, isolated, and economically vulnerable. One study compared 200 working moms with 200 stay-at-home moms, and non-working moms uh, were, a, aka the stay-at-home moms, were 2.43 times more likely to live with depression compared to working moms. Uh, another 2011 study, which followed data over a 10-year span on more than 1,300 mothers, um, Noted that working moms, even those in part-time positions, experienced fewer depressive symptom, symptoms compared to stay-at-home moms. Um, uh, you know, again, women's education, super important. Um, uh, you, you see this across the board uh, when you look at any country's, country's data. When women's education increases, child mortality rate falls, maternal mortality rate falls, child stunting drops. Um, and just the quality of life of people in general seems to go up. Um, finally, um, you know, talking about custody and family courts. Um, yes, again, always better for two fa two parents in the household. But again, twenty seven percent of men seem to completely stop calling and visiting and doing anything uh, to reach out to their children. Um, uh, feminists don't agree on trans issues. Rachel brought that up as well. Um, uh, they don't. They just don't. Um, uh, so I, I don't know what else to say about that. But yeah, women and men, obviously not equal. That is why we need feminism. Um, and if uh, she claims, Rachel claims that feminism is bad for everyone, um, but especially women. My questions would be, how is staying at home, putting the brunt of the um, earning an income for your family on your husband, and then um, having him suffer through that, helping men? Um, how is uh, um, men continuing to have um, breakdowns because of the stress in their life uh, beneficial to men? Um, when women want to take responsibility and um, for their own lives and enter the workforce, it seems like a bad thing. But Rachel will look at any movement that she disagrees with and say that it's being funded by wealthy financiers or by, um, you know, by hedge funds, by people on Wall Street. Um, but there's no there's no personal responsibility there for allowing those movements to grow. There's no possibility that those movements were popular for a reason, not just because they were financed by wealthy financiers. Um, so yeah, that th those are my thoughts on this. Um, and I mean, I had a whole lot more questions, but yeah. Well, um, if you have a couple more, I mean, I have more time. Uh, you know, uh, I, I won't cut it off if you wanna if you wanna ask one. I have a I have a really early flight in the morning though. It's the only reason. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, it's the only thing. But if, if you wanna ask, uh, you had a lot more questions. Well, I, I'll let you get one in. How about that? Uh, does that sound fair? Let me let me see your best one. one. The best one, I guess. Um. Is a woman always obligated to fulfill her wifely duties? And um, and also, um, are there any scenarios where she's not obligated to do that? So, 
what do you mean by wifely duties? So you talk about like women being required or not being required, but women being obligated to provide sex to her husband um, whenever he wants, right? Are there any instances where she is not obligated to do that? Well, I think it's a difficult thing to, <laughs> it's a difficult thing to parse out because it kind of depends on the situation. You have some couples where that's not as big a deal to the people and you have other couples where uh, it is. I personally think it's intrinsic to a marriage because if you're not doing that, you're basically just roommates. Now, uh, when people get much older and they're not as interested, if if that's not a thing, I think it's fine. But I think that marriage implies consent. I do think that. I know that's very controversial. I know there's a lot of people who are going to disagree with me, but I think that marriage vows imply consent. And here is why. Because marriage is supposed to be a Christian sacrament. It's not supposed to be a flimsy legal agreement that's just a roommate contract, that you have cell phone contracts and gym contracts that are harder to break than the marriage vow is. You're supposed to become one flesh. You are supposed to become one with each other. So if you're denying your husband, you're denying yourself and vice versa. There are situations where the man might start cutting off the wife. And I think that's equally awful. I don't think you can say to somebody, you can only ever have sex with me again for the rest of your life. You can't have anyone else. You have to forsake all others, but then I'm going to put the lock down. Now, of course, we hope that both parties, if somebody is sick, right, if somebody is injured, something like, or they're just legitimately exhausted on a particular day, you wouldn't force yourself on the person, of course. But there's going to be plenty of times in a marriage where you might not be like, you're kind of like, oh, it's like the last thing on my mind right now, but I know it's important to my spouse. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do sure. this just like you would anything else. Um, but I just think that within the context of a real marriage that you're one flesh. So you're, it's not the right hand denying the left hand, if that makes sense. But so, yeah, I would agree with you. I think that, you know, with any relationship, some physical intimacy is going to be like um, paramount to making that relationship work and continuing that relationship and making sure it's healthy. Um, and uh, and, you know, um, in a marriage, you know, there probably is some expectation of a minimum amount of physical intimacy that you're going to have with your significant other. Um, I guess my question would be is you, you bring up like um, times where like one of the parties is like just not into it. So let's say. Um, Let's say, like, for example, something that's common is that um, a woman will go through menopause, right? And men in older age, you know, eventually they slow down, but not not at the same time that women do, right? They are still horny. They still, sorry for my language, but they're still, you know, aroused and they want to get down and dirty with their wife, right? But for a significant portion of women, once they go through menopause, um, sex can actually become very painful for them. Um, uh, if it's not painful, there are also women who go through menopause who just have no um, interest in sex anymore. So what would you say for women in that situation? Uh, well, first I'd say get your hormones checked because this is also something that happens really frequency, frequently after pregnancy. Um, I've experienced this and gone and got blood work done and found out that, my, you know, my hormones are non-existent. Mm -hmm. And you get that corrected and suddenly the problem's fine. You, you don't have this problem anymore. And it's a wonderful thing for the woman because women mm -hmm. do like sex. I, I don't know if that, like, we're not supposed to say this, but they do. Women are like sex and they're supposed to like sex, especially mm -hmm. in the context of a marriage. It's a bonding thing for you and your husband. So even if you're like not particularly interested, I think, uh, first of all, there's definitely ways to make it more comfortable because the reason it becomes painful usually has to do with hormonal things that cause atrophy and um, dryness or whatever. Wall, but, yeah. yeah, yeah, you can have atrophy and things like that, but there are things you can do to correct that that you should do anyway for your personal health. I don't want to turn this into like a women's health lesson, but, um, you know, I'm 43. There's, I'm looking into the future and going, okay, what can I do to like keep myself healthy and, and vibrant as much as I can? And so there's things you can do. So I think that to the extent that you can solve this problem, you should. And I think that um, just like men do things for us that they're not in the, do you think a man after he comes home from a long day of work and the woman says, honey, do you think that you could, um, you know, put together the thing I bought for Ikea because I really want to, you know, uh, do this thing in the room and blah, blah, blah. The men don't want to, you know, he's exhausted. It's the last fucking thing he wants to do, but he's like, okay, yes, I, of course, because, you know, it's important to you. So I think it's one of those issues where. Right. You have There's to, going you have to be times, though. 
Yeah, there are going to be times though, like um, postmenopausal women, they will take hormones, um, but you know, and it will help a little bit with the issue of it being painful, but um, but you know, it doesn't help the full way, and sex is still painful for them. Um, what would you say for them? Well, again, I don't want to get too graphic, but there's other things. If some, if one thing hurts, there's other things you can do that are a lot of fun. And you need to <laughs> always have, you need to have fun with your spouse. Like, I don't know what else to say. You need to have fun Isn't with that, your spouse. And I don't uh, think is that, that, that allowed, ends when you get older. What do you it, mean? It, like, like other things that you can do? If, like, it, yeah. If, is it allowed? I'm not Protestant and I'm not Catholic. So yes, we okay. see, we are, uh, Orthodox Christians are very sex positive. We think that it's a gift from God. We think that it's part of the marital life and that it should be, um, in, in good way. And that it's a really, uh, important aspect of like bonding in the relationship. So yeah, there's, there's lots of ways you can have fun with your spouse. Okay. That's all this, I'll say. And you should okay. just enjoy those things. I, I just, I'm so sorry, but I, I do have a question because, uh, and forgive me, because I don't know anything about Christianity, okay? Um, okay. Or I know the very bare minimum about it. But mm -hmm. like, sodomy is supposed to be like, not approved of, right? In Christianity? Yes. Okay. And but in orthodoxy, we really don't like, venture into the marital bedroom. We, we think that within a blessed marriage through the church, what you're doing in your bedroom is really not anyone's business. If you have a problem, like a serious problem that's affecting the marriage, you're supposed to go to your priest who is your spiritual father and talk about that and come to some kind of a compromise or some kind of a solution there. And again, like if, if you have a medical reason, I don't think anybody would say, oh, we have to force the woman because even though she has a medical issue that's making this painful or prohibitive, she has to do it. That would be an issue for them to solve together and maybe with their spiritual father, you know? I, I guess I, I could understand that. I just think, um, I think it's just like a little bit weird that like, okay, the bedroom is like off limits, but like sodomy is very specifically named, right? And sodomy can be oral or anal, right? So. Yeah, like generally we say that married couples can enjoy each other. What when we're talking about with sodomy and usually in the, this is a big thing too, like, Protestants and Catholics have kind of a different take on it than we do, and they've innovated from the original understanding. When we talk about sodomy, we're talking about homosexuals, okay? We're talking about men doing butt stuff, and that is never approved, and it's never okay. Other than that, we think that if you're a married couple and you're in the bedroom, that's your business. I, I guess, uh, yeah, um, that makes sense. Um, but, like, I would say... At, at the very least, it seems that like butt stuff with like a heterosexual couple could like be like um, not beneficial as well, right? To the person whose butt is being, you know, stardust. Well, Look, it depends I'm just on saying. who you're with, stardust. I've been with well, some who uh, you, quite enjoyed well, it actually, but uh, there, if you do too much stuff there, I'm just saying it's not going to be good for that person's butthole either. Okay. So. <laughs> I don't think I'm the person to ask about such things. So, I mean. <laughs> what okay. a spirited debate we had tonight. Well, wait, uh, I have a question. One last ahead. question. One last okay. question. Go I'm ahead. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. No, it's fine. Okay. What if it's a married couple, but it's um, the wife likes to peg the husband? No, absolutely not. That's ever. Behind, oh, the, no. behind the marriage doors. You There's said, no pegging. No, you don't. You don't strap on a fake dick. You don't strap on a fake dick and peg your husband. That's not that's, that's, me then. Though. That's it's homosexual nonsense. That's a deviant woman. No. No. Uh, no. No self-respecting man is going to get pegged. My but husband they have, certainly. They have if I even suggested such a thing, my husband would be like, "Get out!" He'd be like, but "Don't Get they have like, the, Don't men have the it. G spot there in the you, butt? You know, look, I'm not a fan of the butt stuff. Okay. I don't like butt stuff. I think butts are dirty. I think, um, I think that's, that's where it comes from. Homosexuality for a woman to strap on a fake penis and penetrate a man is simulated homosexuality. And no, of course Wait, not. It's a woman. It's not, it's not a man. It's like, it's like the same thing as doing oral, right? I don't know like, how many different ways a, I can say no. What's the I don't difference know how many a woman... more times I can say no. Okay, I get no. I get that. But I don't understand what's the difference between even like a woman's mouth and a man's mouth, right? I guess you're going to have to contact some different priests and pastors and ask them what they think because I'm not the authority. I'm just a woman. So I have to cover my head and be silent in the church. 
But no, I will not be penetrating my husband anytime soon. That's never going to happen. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> Now, this was a hell of a debate, I have to say. Uh, and I did not expect, I'm glad we did the little overtime there, actually, because I really fun, did not yeah. expect it to go there at all. Uh, Stardust, uh, tell them where they can find you, sweetheart. And I appreciate you coming on tonight. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm Stardust. Um, I'm your favorite, um, you know, uh, terrible feminist, uh, feminazi, <laughs> if you will, um, being funded by wealthy financiers. Um, uh, wealthy financiers, please hit me up because I really have been lacking. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, get a hold of the Rockefeller <laughs> Foundation. Get get you that sponsorship. Yeah. Um. But uh. But yeah. Um. You can find me on YouTube.com/slash Stardust Streams. I am putting out video essay content now, so um, occasionally. So check it out. Yeah. Very cool. And, and yeah. Mrs. Wilson, I won't say sweetheart to you because uh, you are <laughs> married. And I, I shouldn't do that to a married lady, but uh, I don't mean it in a you know. Um, uh, you know, pr uh, prof uh, no, you've always, Ralph, you've uh, always been very I'm, respectful. I'm a Southern guy, you know, that's kind of how we talk. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, Mrs. Wilson, where can we find you? Well, you can find my book, Occult Feminism on Amazon. You can find my YouTube channel. It's just at Rachel.Wilson. If you just search my name, a ton of YouTube videos come up. And I also have a substack. It's rwilson.substack.com. And I also want to take a chance to plug my friend, Aaron Clary's book, a world without men, an analysis of an all female economy, because it's brilliant and it's fascinating. It covers a lot of the stuff we're talking about today in great detail. I've just started like really digging into it and I'm trying to really master it, but it's just full of data. It's a really great book. If you want more on the stuff that we've been talking about, highly recommend Aaron Clary and his books. Well, I thank you both for taking the time and I'm sorry for the slight delay in the start that usually doesn't happen on the kill stream, but I had a, just an insane thing happen right beforehand. Uh, and I appreciate both of you, uh, not just saying, fuck it. You know, this guy's late. I can't and, say, uh, you know, I endorse a world without men. In fact, I think we should deport all of the men in America. Like just put them on one Island, you know, send them to Mexico. I'm going, the men Island. <laughs> I'm going to the men Island. Please take me with you. I'm joking. By the way, I don't, I don't mean it. Okay. Uh, so. Thank you, ladies. It was great, just as I knew it would be. And next week, we're going to have Andrew Wilson versus Adam Green here live on the Kill Stream as well. Uh, so the Wilsons are not done here. Uh, thank you, ladies, and say your farewells. Anything else you want to say? Thank you, Stardust. I appreciate thank you. the debate. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I apologize for, you know, any heat, but you know how it's it all is. Right. So, it's yeah. all right. It's all good. It's yeah. all good. It's blood, <laughs> okay. sports. It's blood sports, and we love it. Live here on the Kill Stream. Thank you both, and uh, Happy New Year. Thank you, Happy Ralph. New Year, too. Right. Yeah. Good night. Okay. I actually thought that was great. Thank you for watching this clip. This is Ren. Remember to like and subscribe.